I have the impression that the food industry is growing at an immense rate. There are so many new companies, new products, new foods. It's almost growing as fast as the healthcare industry, it seems to an outsider. Is that so? It does feel, I think that if you go back to the beginning of the Brooklyn Flea, which we started in 2008 um, at a time in Brooklyn where artisanal food and that sort of thing wasn't on every corner in every city and every, in all over the world, um, we, you know, we sort of tapped into like a feeling that people have about homemade food, having a connection to your food, um, some sort of like, uh, so like where... Um, some sort of coolness around your food, and this yeah. is before Instagram and Facebook, really. Even um, if you if you go back those eleven years, and then you know look look at you know what's happened since then, food has been fetishized. It's also been you know disrupted in every way, where like you know the, the ingredients going into it, where those ingredients are from, who the people growing your ingredients are. You know everybody cares so much about every aspect of what they're putting into their bodies. And I didn't realize till you said it all basically in the last eight or ten years and before Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean I think it was going. You know you had Paul yeah. Newman, you had like right. sun-dried tomatoes, you had these you know things that people were interested in, but I think the way that people care so deeply about having choice, having it delivered to them, um, being able to go and have a food experience that, you know, food is now an experience, all these sorts of things, those are all new words in our vocabulary. I think it also mirrors what you've seen in retail in general, right? A move away from these mass, you know, seer, you know, look what happened to Sears, right? You know, people want smaller boutique experiences where they feel like they're getting something special and they're, and they're connecting with, with whatever the experience or the product is. What made you see something to start Smorgasburg? Well, Smorgas we, Smorgasburg, as Eric just said, the Brooklyn Flea started in 2008, right. which is a flea market that happened to have food at it. And the, the food just happened to start to get more and more popular. And we were offered a uh, spot on the waterfront in Williamsburg uh, for the 2011 season, and we had to think of a slightly new concept because we didn't want to compete against our own flea market. So we thought, oh, we're getting all these incredible food applications, but we can't accept them in our flea market. Um, so we decided to do a smorgasbord in Williamsburg, and that's, that started in May of 2011, and that, that kind of just immediately took off. Uh, and that's, that's how we got to, you know, today. Couldn't have planned it exactly that way. You just... No. Played it as well, a well, they, they play. say a lot of a lot of successes in life is luck and timing, right? And taking and, advantage and we were, of the yeah. opportunity. So I think we saw, you know, I think we started something. Uh, the flea market we started really out of passion and in a sense of local Brooklynites feeling like Brooklyn is crazy. Here was this cool, huge, creative borough that didn't have a flea market. Um, we both had gone to the flea markets in Chelsea in the in the 1990s religiously, and those those had mostly gotten pushed out by real estate development. And we thought, hey, let's, you know. And the nice thing about starting a flea market is that, that there's not a lot of financial risk, right? So you can start it, see what happens. Because you rent and, uh, the space. Yeah, we rented a space the from a schoolyard in Fort Greene. Uh, you know, we spent a little money in the couple months leading up to it, but not a lot. Some some cones and, you know, you some markers press, and stuff. got the Brooklyn Flea. Got, yeah. Well, yeah. There the, was New headlines. When are they going to close? Second, when are they going to reopen well, for the, the spring? The, the second weekend, uh, the New York Times did a big style section spread on us. And, yeah, there's a little neighborhood kerfuffle in the in the summer that got us in the metro section. Um, yeah. And uh, If you yeah. go back to that time and you look at what Jonathan and I were doing, Jonathan had a blog called Brownstoner. So, first of all, a blog about, that was Brooklyn centric. If you go back to the mid 2000s, was a novel idea, and Jonathan's blog took off and became sort of a voice for the new Brooklyn. At that time, I was the speechwriter for Marty Markowitz, the Brooklyn Borough President, who was going around trying to brand Brooklyn as an entity separate from Manhattan, right? And so the two of us, before we even started working together, were thinking about Brooklyn as a brand, right? And so now, Every cool neighborhood in Nashville, in Washington D.C., in uh, you know Seattle is the Brooklyn of that city, right? They, there's the Brooklyn of Tokyo. There's the Brooklyn of uh, you know of London, right? And so, um, the flea when we started in 2008 kind of bottled that and helped Brooklyn become not just a place separate from Manhattan, but sort of an idea of how you want your city to be. And I think it drew a lot of Manhattanites. I mean, I, I grew up in Manhattan, and prior to the age of 30, I'd been to Brooklyn probably five times, you know? And so I think there, when the flea opened in 2008, you had these people from Manhattan coming out 
you know, fashion people, whoever coming out, getting out of the C train in Fort Greene and looking around, being like, this is the most beautiful place on the planet. This is incredible. I didn't, how does this, how did I not know this existed? So I think we really kind of opened a lot of people's eyes to the physical beauty of Brooklyn as well. I feel like I'm talking to the founders of the new Brooklyn, in a, I mean, in a way. You were there early, but not too oh. early. But these stories you tell there was there was a, There was a New York Magazine article at some point that basically, <laughs> that basically yeah. said that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think lots of people were working together right, during yeah. that time who were our friends and colleagues, and right. I think that it was, you know, it's one of those things. You can look back and call it a, you know, a movement or a trend or something like that, but at the time it was just... It was more like people were pushed out of Manhattan. We were starting families in Brooklyn because we could get a little more space. That was really what Brooklyn was at that point. And you could say the same thing goes for chefs, right? You, you have often a lot more interesting chefs popping up in Brooklyn because it's a bit cheaper. Increasingly less so, but at, but at that time. Um, and what you had during that time, too, was Brooklyn pivoted from becoming a place that was kind of the, the runner-up, like, well, we can't really afford Manhattan anymore, so let's go to Brooklyn. At some point in there, you know, I don't know, 2010 or so, call it, things shifted to people being, you know, people with a ton of money who could live anywhere saying, you know what, I want to live in Brooklyn because it's lower density, it's a nicer place to raise my kids, I can, you know, people say hi to me when I walk down the block, all this stuff that you realize uh, Manhattan can't give you in the same way. Do you want to pull the bridge up and you have enough uh, <laughs> residents? I mean, it would be quite a trick. But... Well, without the L train, it's basically that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Business wise, you run smorgasbirds <clears throat> all over the city and even in other cities now. Mm -hmm. I mean, for business owners, how did you grow that fast and how do you manage all these operations you have going on simultaneously? We're a really small team, actually, and I think that in a way is uh, how we do it. We, keep it, we, we have um, <clears throat> people we can trust, people who are devoted. Um, we have people that have been working with us for the entire time, you know, 10, 11 years, so everybody knows the business inside and out. They have no interest in leaving. Um, a lot of these folks don't want a regular job, so we're not a regular job. We, you know, you're out there on the weekends with thousands of people, and the vendors are kind of quirky personalities, and you're kind of part of this phenomenon. So that's a big piece. You know, the people that work for us are, are really motivated. Um, they love what they do. It's different. And so that has a lot to do with it, right? It's what is it? Why don't they want to leave and go to a bigger company? What motivates them? Well, there's something special about what we do and something unique. So, you, you know, there's a lot of copycats out there as well. And you look at those markets or food halls or whatever, and you go, that's an interesting thing, but it's not, it doesn't speak to me. And whereas I think Smorgasburg has this authenticity, whatever you want to call it, it is an actual real market. It's free, it's open to the public, there's tens of thousands of people coming in. When you're standing in there at that market, <clears throat> feeling like you've had, you're playing a role in um, not only bringing those people to the neighborhood, helping those small businesses, seeing people being really happy, eating all their food and sharing it and making new friends, it's totally different than sitting in a cubicle during the week. I would say too. Playing a role in something important. But I would also say that we, you know, you re reference our fast growth, and I would actually say that we've actually been consciously, I would describe the growth more as moderate, actually. I think that as a brand, we kind of exploded, and the, you see the brand in a lot of places, and a lot of people know it. So from that perspective, we, it was fast growth, I guess. But actually, we've been very conscious, uh, if you contrast it with, you know, venture capital funded companies, yeah. for example. We've been very conscious about not taking that money. That changes. You've been offered it? They would, the yeah. big money's chased oh, you already. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but but it changes the character yeah. of the company. It changes the decisions you make. It changes how you treat your employees and it, all this kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, Eric and I are a couple guys with both have two kids and we live within walking distance of the office. And there's, you know, there's certain balance that we've struck. And we've been, in, in many ways, quite careful and conservative about how we've grown the company because we've seen a lot of examples. We've seen examples of friends companies and other companies where they've taken that, that money and all, it changes everything and all of a sudden the private equity guys really own you and two years later the growth rate is uh, you know 15% instead of 50% and they're, they're throwing you overboard, right? And so we've been really careful not to make a de decision uh, A, to take that money but also B, when we look at individual projects we, ne we never want to do something where if that one project goes badly, it could take the whole business down. It could take down 10 years of work. So 
that that you know implies a certain level of uh, sort of conservatism ultimately. Even though we are always trying to grow, but we're trying to be smart. Uh, you know, and I think there's sort of this this myth about entrepreneurs that they're risk takers, right? Most successful entrepreneurs spend most of their time trying to minimize risk, right? right. And so it's a, it's an interesting balance there. I just have to ask, what do the venture? What would they possibly do? With the Brooklyn flea market, I mean, how are they going to le leverage or capitalize that? What was the idea? Well, so with, one of the beauties about it is that we don't need that much capital, right? Right. So that's been made it a little easier to say no. But you know, we are we are uh, obviously New York City is in Brooklyn in particular is our core. But we've we where we do, we have big markets on Saturday and Sundays in Brooklyn. But in 2016, we expanded to downtown LA, and that now is a booming market. We get you know 12,000. People a day, every Sunday there. But I mean, what um, was their vision? Did they want to open one in every town in America or something? Well, I wouldn't say that we even really got that. Oh, We've okay. gotten that. It's something like that. It's like a scale, right? Yeah. On a scale. So some of them thought uh, have markets in all the you know small to medium sized cities, and you know some of them think they could bring their brands and sponsors to the table. Some uh, of them yeah. think that we should do a bunch of food halls and a TV right. show, and yeah. so everybody comes in with their ideas, and we say, yeah, we've had that idea, and we don't really like that idea that much. We yeah. like the organic. It's also, you know, re real estate uh, developers are constantly approaching us, right? Because if you think about what we do, part of what we do is we, we you know, placemaking is kind of a buzzy word now, but we're able to take, like in downtown LA, we basically went into a desert and we created this thing that now 12,000 people come every day. And it's, a, it's part of a larger play. It's a, it's a 30 acre site in downtown LA that's being gradually redeveloped. And we're driving people there every weekend, which makes it easier to start leasing other other retail spots. Makes it, you know, tenants, uh, office tenants are more likely to be there if they see fun stuff happening. And so, we're quite attractive to real estate developers who are, especially when they're doing big projects, and they're like, how do we kind of kickstart this thing? How do we make sure people are coming? There's something fun. Millennials are coming. All this stuff uh, that we can deliver. <laughs> so, it's a, in the end of the day, if you think about it, that's a lot of what our business is accomplishing, oh, even though that's not necessarily what we're how we're deriving our money. Uh, just to wrap up, it, it's not a farmer's market, but you eat there mm -hmm. at the Smorgasburgs, right? Yep. Yeah, that's basically... It's like a picnic, and you bring a blanket. Yeah, like each booth, each 10 by 10 booth, you know, it's literally 100 square feet, is like a little restaurant. A prepared food, not yeah. food to take home. Okay. Yeah, there is some packaged foods there, but the, the core of it is like, it's the guy who's been working as a chef in a really nice restaurant, or a gal, of course, um, and has been kind of toiling away in a basement or the back of a restaurant, knowing that their real dream is to recreate their, you know, their Yugoslavian grandmother's uh, meatballs or something like that. And so they're tired of working for someone else. They don't want to be in a, you know, in a restaurant environment. They want to be out there talking to people. They want to do their own thing. Sometimes they're doing it on the side while they still have a job, and so they're they're like real chefs. They're not food trucks either, right? No. This isn't, and they're not, um, you know, it's not a pop-up restaurant. These are new concepts being launched on our platform, a hundred of them at, uh, on every every weekend with twenty thousand people coming. So it's sort of like a food festival, but it happens every week, and it's free to get in. So it's it sort of like combines a lot of different things, but it is not a farmer's market. It's a place to go and stuff your face with lots of your friends and take pictures of it. And uh, it's a place for the chefs the to test new concepts. And instead of immediately risking money on a new restaurant, they can spend a couple years at Smorgasburg, you know, getting, getting press, building up social media following, interacting directly with people who are trying their food, getting feedback, so that when, you know, two years later, they want to go ask their aunt and uncle, you know, for money to launch their hole in the wall, They've got something to actually show. They've got some proof in, in the pudding, really. Thank you for what you guys are doing. Oh, Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much. Us.